Hello and welcome everyone to the Varsity Tutor STEM Success Series where whether you like it or not, the weather this winter is pretty wild. Yes, the weather outside is frightful and to quite a few people that's actually pretty delightful. If you're a skier or a snowboarder, you might like this snow. And if you're a storm chaser, this is an amazing season, which is why we're so thrilled to have maybe the world's preeminent storm chaser, Reed Timmer here to tell us all about wild winter weather, what its causes are, what its effects are, and uh, what he's excited uh, to, to watch with you guys throughout this winter. Now, as you can tell from the title, this is not a fair weather class for fair weather fans. We want to make sure you're as active as the jet stream. So please use the chat box to the right of the video. Reed's going to ask you some questions to find out about your experiences with and knowledge of weather. So answer his questions there. And if you have any questions about wild winter weather throughout the class, drop those in the chat. Feel free to put your name on them so we know who's asking. And in the last 10 minutes or so of class, I'll interview Reed with your questions and we'll see whether he knows all those answers. Also make sure one last thing, you've got a camera nearby in about a half an hour, we're gonna give everybody a chance to lean into the screen and get a selfie, or maybe we call it a freeze frame with Reeds. And if you upload that to Instagram and tag Reed, tag Varsity Tutors, you'll be entered to win a wild wacky weather kit. That's the official title. So you know, it'll be a whole lot of fun. So have those cameras ready. Uh, we'll take those pictures in about a half an hour. All right, I'm looking at the forecast for today and it's gonna be partly educational with a 100% chance of fun. So let me introduce your teacher for today, Storm Chaser extraordinaire, Reed Timmer. Hi everybody, I'm Storm Chaser Reed Timmer and many of you may know me from ch chasing down tornadoes in my armored vehicle, the Dominator. There you can see one of those big tornadoes up in South Dakota we intercepted years ago. But I also chase big time snowstorms, uh, some of the biggest winter weather ever uh, to impact the United States, North America and beyond. I've chased lake effect snow, atmospheric river events, thunder snow, big time blizzards. I've seen over nine feet of snow in a 24 hour period. But instead of telling you about it, I'm gonna show you exactly what I've intercepted over the years in terms of extreme winter weather. And you can see a common theme in many of these videos is wind and very heavy snow. We're gonna talk about the science behind what creates heavy snow, what creates a different uh, types of precipitation as well, snow, sleet, or freezing rain. What causes these big winds to happen too and cause those blizzard conditions that'll reduce visibility to near zero. There is nothing more terrifying than if you're driving down the road and you suddenly hit one of those whiteout conditions, the visibility can drop to zero. And there's also nothing more dangerous than an ice storm. I've chased down many of these ice storms where you have thunderstorms coming in, dropping inches of freezing rain. Many of the trees will fall under the weight of the ice. That ice will accumulate on the road surfaces as well. But we're going to break down the science behind all of this crazy winter weather. And I'm going to tell you about it from a storm chaser's perspective and from the perspective of an extreme meteorologist. And we're going to begin with a question here. Where is the snowiest location in the United States? I'm seeing some good answers so far already. I see some lake effect zones in there, some mountainous areas there in Colorado. Many of these areas uh, uh, are impacted by the same type of storm, but actually the snowiest location in the entire United States on a seasonal average, this is for an entire year, is Mount Rainier, Washington with over 645 inches in a single season. But the record for a 24 hour period is actually in Colorado in a mountainous area there with over 70 inches in a 24 hour period. Many locations as well in the Great Lakes areas like Buffalo, New York, especially the Tug Hill Plateau, downwind of Lake Ontario. There is some unconfirmed reports of even greater snowfall totals than that. Four or 500 inches in a single season are definitely not out of question there uh, in the Tug Hill Plateau from Lake Effect Insanity. But these big snows that you see in Mount Rainier with over 600 inches in a single season, a lot of times those come from what's called an atmospheric river. And many of you have heard of atmospheric rivers on the news. And it's really a very narrow phenomenon about 300 miles wide, but very long. Uh, stretches all the way from Hawaii down in the subtropics or the tropical Pacific. There's a ton of moisture down there. And this is also called a pineapple express. That's why, because it comes from those subtropical areas uh, down in the Pacific near Hawaii, picks up all the moisture. And it's basically an energized jet stream, very strong winds as well. And it transports all that moisture up toward the West Coast. And you can see there in the bottom image, those winter storm warnings in the Sierra Nevadas of California, all the way up through the Cascades 
Cascades of Washington, those areas often get hammered by these atmospheric river events. And you can see in that video with that lightning striking there, that was a big time atmospheric river in Mammoth Mountain, California that I covered and intercepted it. We had 30 flashes of lightning uh, during that time. Winds gusted over 100 miles an hour at the ridges up there near Mammoth Mountain, uh, California with an intense atmospheric river. Blizzard warnings were in effect as well. And we had over 70 inches of snow from that event over about a 36 hour period there at the base of Mammoth Mountain and a very energized jet stream. But we're gonna talk about jet streams a lot later and the different types of precipitation because on this event, right when that lightning was starting, the very heavy snow changed over to ice pallets and a little bit of freezing rain for about five minutes before getting blasted by whiteout conditions again after that. I know many of you also mentioned lake effect snowstorms for those big time snow events and some of the snowiest places on average for a season. I grew up there in Grand Rapids, Michigan, just to the east of Lake Michigan. And the seasonal averages there in Grand Rapids are over 70 inches for an entire winter season, whereas in Milwaukee, areas of Wisconsin, you get a lot less, about 20, 30, 40 inches less than you get to the east side of the lake. And lake effect snow can lead to some of the heaviest snowfall rates as well. Four to six inches per hour are definitely not out of the question. Here you can see some of those big time bands flowing off Lake Superior and also with Lake Erie. And the wind direction is key here. Uh, and really the fundamentals behind lake effect are you have cold air, very cold cold air just above the ground flowing down uh, from the north that goes over the relatively warm waters that are the Great Lakes uh, because of the nature of water has a higher specific heat uh, capacity. Uh, it takes a lot longer for those water uh, temperatures in the large Great Lakes to cool down after a long summer and usually in the early winter when that cold air starts to come down from Canada it picks up the moisture off the lake and you can even get little miniature thunderstorms even supercell storms that line up parallel to that wind direction and areas downstream of those intense bands get absolutely hammered. And I was just watching a, an area in Japan uh, earlier today. They're getting hammered by ocean effect snow. One of the snowiest places in the world are the Alps, the mountains there uh, of northern Japan, because they get a similar phenomenon as lake effect when that cold air comes down from Siberia, picks up that moisture off the Sea of Japan and dumps it in the form of feet of snow. And I covered this uh, Buffalo Lake Effect emergency back in 2014, nine feet of snow over a couple of days period. Uh, and, and it was sunny before, even warm and sunny. People were wearing shorts, uh, short sleeve shirts the day before. Then that Arctic blast came in. The bands organized over Lake Erie. Five to six inch per hour snowfall rates arrived. I had to buy a one piece uh, snowsuit from Walmart because my vehicle, I had to abandon the vehicle because the snow was coming down so heavy that I had to cover this storm on foot insane thunder and lightning as well. And over nine feet of snow fell from this just to the south of downtown Buffalo. And the crazy thing is, it's about five miles to the south of this band, sunny skies, completely dry, just to the north in the core of the band, absolute winter insanity, blizzard, nine feet of snow. You simply could not drive in those conditions. And it actually turned life-threatening in Buffalo there because the conditions arrived so rapidly that some people were trapped in their vehicles wearing shorts and short sleeves when these dangerous winter storm conditions arrived. Some other big time snowstorms that happen. And these are the two most common storm tracks that we get. And there's actually a system right now that is lifting slowly northeast toward the Great Lakes. It's forecast to lift north out of northern Mexico. And that's going to bring an ice storm across northern Missouri, southeastern Iowa, northern Illinois. I'm sure many of you weather enthusiasts are watching all the winter alerts as they're coming out. But generally, you see two different storm tracks for snowstorms in the United States. And these are low pressure systems at the surface. And one thing uh, I'd like to really uh, uh, discuss uh, during this live briefing is to look at the atmosphere like a layer cake. It exists in different layers in the atmosphere. This happens to be at the surface, uh, at the ground. This is a surface low pressure here. And the atmosphere is always striving to achieve equilibrium. So air generally goes from high pressure to low pressure to alleviate uh, that imbalance in pressure. But pressure is basically the weight of the atmosphere in the column above where we're standing. Uh, air definitely has weight, uh, has molecules above you. And that low pressure there drives the wind around it. And those Colorado lows eject from Eastern Colorado toward the Great Lakes. You also get nor'easters or coastal storms that rip up the East Coast, thriving off of those temperature gradients that we see during winter. But usually the very heaviest snow falls just to the north and the northwest side of those surface lows. Here you can see the Colorado low and the nor'easter the two most common storm tracks in the United States east of the Rocky Mountains. 
And blizzards. Uh, these are driven by wind speed as well. And the general definition of blizzards has changed quite a bit over the years. Uh, the current accepted definition are sustained winds of greater than 35 miles an hour over a three to four hour period, reducing visibility frequently below a quarter mile. And that's the key is that low visibility, but it doesn't need to be heavy snow that's actually falling. And this is one thing that's important about a blizzard is you can have ground blizzards where the snow may fall the previous day, maybe the previous weeks or months before that. And then you can have big time wind that comes and picks up that snow. Uh, you get blowing snow that can reduce visibility below a quarter mile for uh, that three to four hour uh, threshold and greater. Ground blizzards are really common over the, the Northern Plains, uh, Eastern North Dakota, South Dakota up there uh, because uh, those big time Arctic blasts come in. And sometimes you only get one or two inches of snow, very dry air masses, but because it's so windy, it picks up all that snow and definitely creates very dangerous whiteout conditions. Blizzards are certainly one of the most dangerous phenomenon to cover. And many of you may have heard of a bomb cyclone. So those two surface lows that I showed you, the Colorado low and the Nor'easter, sometimes when the conditions are just right, those surface lows can intensify rapidly with their central pressure dropping at a rate of greater than 20 24 millibars in a 24 hour period. And that's called a bomb cyclone. And those are where blizzard conditions are most common because of those really low pressure and the wind getting driven around that storm system. And now we'll get to another question as we're covering the different types of precipitation that you get with these winter storms with the ice storm heading through Northern Missouri towards Southeastern Iowa and Northern Illinois. Uh, we're going to discuss what causes uh, snowfall to happen, what causes sleet or ice pellets and freezing rain. If you're looking at the atmosphere in a layer cake, that's most important. So I'm going to start off with this question. When water falls from the sky, what determines whether it'll be rain, freezing rain, sleet, or snow? I see a lot of incredible answers already streaming in related to temperature, moisture as well. And that one's right. Really the key to determine uh, when water falls from the sky, what that precipitation type is gonna be. If you view the atmosphere in terms of a layer cake, it's the temperature at different layers in that atmosphere. And when you get freezing rain or sleet, you have a warm above freezing layer just above the ground, and you still have that below freezing air at the surface. Ice storms like this are caused when an Arctic air mass surges south from the north. Usually it's a bit of a shallow air mass as well. Cold air is more dense than warm air. So that cold air slides underneath the existing warm air. And then you get one of those storm systems like the Colorado low or a nor'easter. And you start getting warm air pumped to the north just above the ground over top that below freezing layer. And here you can see that layer cake, that image on the left. Generally, snowflakes form in the mid-levels of the atmosphere. Uh, this goes up with height, but notice how the pressure decreases as the weight of the air above any given point higher above the ground is less. So really, the snow forms in the mid-levels of the atmosphere at about 15,000 feet. That's when those big clumps, those giant dendrites, as we call them, those snowflakes develop when you have lift and moisture in the mid-levels of the atmosphere. Those snowflakes then fall down into that above freezing layer, turning back into liquid water. And then they fall into that shallow below freezing layer, but they don't have enough time uh, to refreeze back into ice pellets or sleet. But they are super cooled water droplets at that time, and they freeze on anything. Here you can see that barbed wire fence in North Texas when I was chasing, actually, hurricane. Zeta, I had to drive through a big time ice storm in the Southern Plains just to get to Louisiana to intercept that hurricane. But it dumped one to two inches of ice accumulating on everything that it hit, the trees, the power lines, those areas were without power uh, for over a week, uh, some areas even longer than that. You can even get thunderstorms that'll form in this environment, dumping incredibly heavy rain that falls into the sub freezing layer. And I would say that the most dangerous type of storm is a, a freezing rain a based ice storm like this because it's so slippery. Uh, your frictional coefficients uh, go way down on the road surfaces. They're so destructive as well in terms of roof damage, power lines, everything coming down. And, uh, and it's very hard to drive when freezing rain comes down like this. But many people confuse freezing rain for sleet or ice pellets which is yet another different type of precipitation. And sleet happens when that low level sub freezing layer, below freezing layer is thicker. And uh, this is a little bit different than the freezing rain profile, but anytime you hear those little noises like little rocks hitting the window when freezing rain arrives, you could hear it in this video. 
That's actually a storm in eastern Colorado or eastern Wyoming from a storm chaser friend of mine. That is textbook sleet. And a lot of weather enthusiasts aren't a big fan of sleet because a lot of times they'll hold down those snowfall totals. If you are a snow lover like I am, uh, when the precipitation will mix over with sleet, there you can see some thunder sleet in that video. It'll definitely hold down the snowfall totals quite a bit. Uh, but sleet can give you a little bit more traction when you're driving around out there. Uh, so freezing rain, I think, is the most dangerous precipitation type. Sleet, though, is just an individual frozen raindrop. That's all it is. Very different than hail. And we're going to show you some insane hail videos a little bit later. But sleet is just a frozen individual raindrop that has a, falls into a below freezing layer that's deep enough to facilitate that refreezing. But once again, those snowflakes usually develop in the mid levels of the atmosphere. They fall into that above freezing layer, turn into liquid water droplets, and then fall and refreeze in that deeper below freezing layer with the sleep profile. And this profile that shows the layer cake of temperature and moisture, this is called a skew T. And it's basically like a uh, basically a graph paper that's intended uh, to plot atmospheric variables. The red line there is temperature. You can see that zero line. That's the dark blue line. So once that red line goes above zero, you can see where that above freezing layer is identified there. That's that red layer just above the ground. That's what melts those snowflakes into liquid water before they fall into that deeper freezing layer below it. Then you can see that red line go back below the zero line showing the depth of that layer uh, below freezing. And then of course, there's the, the hail uh, profile. And we'll show you the video first. Oh, Not sure the oh. windshield's gonna last much longer. Yeah, take a right. Dude, that, I think. Oh, we got uh -oh. this destroyed one right. Oh! <laughs> All right, we got to keep going. Oh! And you can definitely hear those impacts hitting the windshield. And from a storm chaser perspective, I have to say there is nothing more fun than intercepting a massive hailstorm like that. I saw my first massive hailstone in 2002 in southwestern Kansas, May 7th. That was the first time that I blew out my windshield. And you could see those huge hailstones getting ejected from the back of a supercell storm. You could see them way up high in the atmosphere. And hail like this is very different than sleet. So hail is, uh, forms during severe weather season when you get a large area of warm, moist air underneath all the way down to the surface. And then above that, you have cold air in the mid and high levels of the atmosphere, wind shear as well. You get supercell storms and they'll suspend those hail hailstones inside the updraft. They circulate around, accumulating layer upon layer of ice, super cooled water droplets actually suspended high up into the storm. And once they get really large, sometimes up to the size of softballs, they fall out of the sky destroy windshields of storm chasers vehicles down below, but definitely shows you the true power of those updrafts and supercell storms during severe weather season. And now uh, the favorite profile of us snow lovers, the snow profile. And as I mentioned, those big snowflakes called dendrites, those form in the mid levels of the atmosphere at 500 millibars. That's the pressure level that those often form. And uh, one thing that you need in addition to an entire profile below freezing, notice how that red line never crosses the zero line to get above freezing. So the entire profile is below freezing, but also to get those big snowflakes, you need a lot of lift and moisture in the mid levels of the atmosphere. And that helps to grow those big time flakes and aggregates that you see coming down uh, to support those four to five inch per hour snowfall rates that you often get with lake effect snow events, atmospheric rivers, or on the north side of those Colorado lows and nor'easters. And now I have another question. I've shown you a lot of thunder snow, even thunder sleet, thunder freezing rain. Is thunder snow dangerous? And also, what is thunder snow in general? I know it's lightning while snow falls, but really, what conditions come together uh, to, to receive thunder snow? And you're right, thunder snow can be dangerous, even though this is incredibly rare. When you hear thunder, it's associated with lightning. And uh, it would be possible to get cloud to ground lightning uh, during a snowstorm. I've seen it during lake effect events. I've seen it during atmospheric rivers. And it is possible to even get struck by lightning in a thunder snow event. But the most dangerous part about that condition is that when thunder snow happens, it means that a thunderstorm exists in an environment that's cold enough to support snowfall. So you get instability. You also get that entire layer cake below freezing. 
And a thunderstorm produces very heavy precipitation. So when thundersnow happens, you know that there is big time snowfall happening with snowfall rates often four, five, six inches per hour. The recent nor'easter that hammered Binghamton uh, with over 40 inches of snow, that recorded hourly snowfall rates in excess of six inches uh, per hour. And of course, those major snowfall rates were associated with thunder snow on the north side of that powerful nor'easter. Another question, what are the two main ingredients meteorologically for heavy snow? I've mentioned it already, but there are two main ingredients to get those big, massive flakes that fall from the sky. They get all of us snow lovers so excited. See a couple of answers coming in already. Moisture, cold temperatures, those are all great answers. But really the two main ingredients for heavy snow are lift, and moisture. Aside from the temperature profile uh, being below freezing, you need that lift in the mid-levels of the atmosphere as well. And that can be accomplished by the jet stream, a trough, an upper level storm system in the jet stream. We're going to be talking about that next. Uh, that moisture can also be uh, supplied by a low pressure system. So the winds around a low pressure system generally flow counterclockwise, but they also go in toward that low pressure. And when that wind converges at the low pressure, that causes lift, but it also pumps moisture northward on the east side of that low. And that moisture can wrap around on the cold side to the north of that low pressure system. And then that snow can fall as very, very heavy snow. And you really need that lift to focus in the mid levels of the atmosphere at about 15,000 feet up. If that lift focuses closer to the ground, then you get those really small flakes. A lot of times it'll mix in with sleet, freezing rain. You get the little ice column uh, type snowflakes and you don't have a lot of lift in the mid levels of the atmosphere. But to get those big dinner plate sized snowflakes coming from the sky, you really need that lift in the mid levels of the atmosphere and also moisture to grow those flakes. No pressure, but here's a tough meteorology question. What is the biggest cause of storms? It's a very general question, uh, but what is the general cause of the wind inside these storms that can lead to blizzard conditions and uh, cause these massive ice storms as well? And I see that the hint in this question is definitely working out. Pressure gradients, uh, temperature gradients are definitely good ones. The jet stream, another great question, another great answer. Kind of that highway in the mid and upper levels of the atmosphere that determines uh, the direction uh, of these storm systems. And in general, pressure gradients within the atmosphere uh, determine wind. Uh, wind very generally likes to flow uh, from high pressure to low pressure. The Earth's rotation that happens causes a deflection of that motion as it flows from high pressure to low pressure. If that flow uh, exists over a large enough distance, on the order of about a thousand kilometers, you get the greatest uh, deflection, that and larger. But the atmosphere is constantly trying to achieve equilibrium and find balance. And that's why under low pressure, the weight of the atmosphere is less. You have less air above you. Under high pressure, you have more air molecules above you, greater weight of that air column above you. So that high pressure wants to take some of its air and ship it on over to the low pressure and try to equalize those pressure differences. And in the process of that happening, you get big time winter storms. There you could see one of those low pressure systems like the Colorado low or the uh, nor'easter. Those are at the surface. And remember to visualize the atmosphere like a layer cake. The image on the right is the jet stream from the incredible pivotal weather uh, site for visualizing model forecasts. You could see a channel of stronger winds in the mid and upper levels of the atmosphere that drives the surface low tracks underneath it. Usually these surface lows like a Colorado low or a nor'easter like to form downstream of these big troughs. I always say life is just a series of troughs and ridges. And uh, after the trough then the ridge comes in behind it, high pressure likes to form just to the east of those ridges. In the Southern hemisphere, it's the opposite though. A ridge is actually a storm system and a trough is actually a high pressure. But here in the Northern hemisphere, the trough, that's that uh, upper level storm system where just to the east of that, you get those surface pressure falls and the air likes to go toward from high pressure to low pressure. So you can see those wind vectors that are going around counterclockwise at that surface low on the left. They're also going in toward that low pressure. And because that's at ground level, that wind has nowhere to go and it's forced up. And that's called convergence, upward motion, upward velocities. That's how you get precipitation. 
The southerly winds to the east of the low pressure that pumps moisture northward from the Gulf of Mexico or from the Gulf Stream. Those are the uh, two predominant moisture sources for these storm systems uh, east of the Rocky Mountains, aside from the atmospheric river that's pulling it up from the subtropics down near Hawaii. But in general, these low pressure systems are responsible for big snow. And that happens on the north and the northwest side of that low pressure system. That's where the cold air is located, where the moisture meets the cold air. Uh, usually the fronts uh, also can contribute to lift. You often get converging winds along the cold front there. That's the blue front to the south of the uh, low pressure, the warm front, the warm air lifting northward on the east side. And you often get convergence and lift along those fronts as well as in general along low pressure systems. But the jet stream, that channel of air aloft, is driven by temperature gradients in the extra tropics. Up here in the extra tropics, you have very cold air up at the polar regions, warmer air off to the south. And especially during the winter, when that temperature gradient is maximized, that's when you get the strongest jet streams. The stronger the temperature gradient in the mid latitudes, the stronger the winds aloft high up in the atmosphere, which is the jet stream with the troughs and ridges driving those surface lows out ahead of them. There are some other ways to generate lift as well, not just on the synoptic scale or the large scale, uh, like those low pressure systems, but you can also get what's called orographic lift. And this can happen in a lot of locations. I use the Rocky Mountains as an example. I've covered many of those big time uh, snow emergencies there on the north side of that low pressure. So if you can imagine the wind going counterclockwise around a low pressure, when you get a big time bomb cyclone or really any surface low that forms just to the east of the Rocky Mountains, the easterly winds on the north side of that low can get forced up the terrain and that creates lift. It cools uh, the temperature, cools to the dew point, and eventually you start squeezing out that moisture in the form of heavy snowfall if the cold air is sufficient. There are a lot of other variables as well, but sometimes these orographic lift events, uh, upslope events we call them, they can drop three or four feet of snow and they often happen in the spring months or the fall. And one problem with intercepting an orographic lift event in Colorado is usually the warm sectors of these storm systems often produce tornadoes. So I've had to choose, do I wanna cover the three or four foot storm, snowstorm in the uh, foothills of the Colorado Rockies, or do I wanna cover the tornado potential in the warm sector? I almost always go for the tornadoes. But about five years ago, I did cover one there in the foothills to the west of Golden, Colorado dumped 48 inches of snow. And of course, the warm sector had about three or four tornadoes down there to the southeast of the surface low. And now we're gonna talk about uh, what, what I specialize in really are tornadoes, chasing tornadoes, of course. I chase all forms of winter weather, hurricanes as well. Uh, but tornadoes are probably the uh, weather phenomenon that I chase the most. Many people may think that tornadoes only happen in the spring or the summer months, uh, but they also can happen in winter. And so I'm going to ask a question. This one's multiple choice. How many tornadoes did the U.S. as a whole average per winter? So that would be December, January, February, meteorological winter, 1950, or, uh, 1990 to 2015 average. No, several thousand. That's a little much. We actually only get just above 1,000 tornadoes in the U.S. as a whole on average for the entire season. But during the winter months, that's correct. C is the correct answer. We get just shy of 100 tornadoes uh, during the winter season in the United States. And that includes the months of December, January, and February. But anytime you're talking about averages, you never want to get too bogged down in those because there can be some seasons where you get a lot more tornadoes than 100. There can be individual days where you get a lot more tornadoes than that. Uh, I always uh, bring up the Super Tuesday event, uh, February 5th, 2008. Uh, dozens of tornadoes across Arkansas, uh, areas off to the east of Arkansas as well, in an area called Dixie Alley. Uh, that's an area of heightened tornado potential uh, that stretches basically from the Piney Woods of eastern Texas, the Ozarks, of Northwestern Arkansas all the way east across Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana. And actually there is a threat of tornadoes tomorrow across portions of Southwestern Dixie Alley down there in Louisiana. And I have split these uh, tornado hotspots across the United States into individual zones based on consistent storm chasing terrain and also the storms behaving similarly out there. And really the areas that get a lot of wintertime tornadoes are Dixie Alley and the area just to the east of the Southern Appalachians, uh, the Piedmont, Mid-Atlantic zone, we call it there. And that's because 
those two locations are very close to the Gulf of Mexico and the Gulf Stream, which are relatively warm this time of year. And that can, for these very dynamic storm systems, you can still get major tornado outbreaks in Dixie Alley. Here's one of those videos coming up here, but it looks like tomorrow, uh, there definitely is gonna be a, a, a potential uh, event there in Dixie Alley with uh, tornadoes. There's gonna be snow and ice on the north side of that. But really, if the ingredients come together uh, for tornadoes, even in winter, you can still get them. And that involves heat and moisture at the low levels of the atmosphere. There you can see one of those tornadoes in Dixie Alley. And that was actually an EF5 tornado during the super outbreak. And uh, that happened in 2011. You can see those horizontal tornadoes feeding into the uh, very powerful tornado, one of the strongest that I've ever seen. That was in Mississippi. And this tornado here was actually so strong that it dug a trench in the ground that was two feet deep and about 200 yards long. It wasn't necessarily given that rating because of structural damage that it caused. But this is the only tornado that I'm aware of that was given an EF5 rating because it dug a trench in the ground. And that shows you just how strong those winds can get. Generally, an EF5 is assumed to have greater than 200 mile per hour winds, but sometimes uh, tornadoes like that can produce winds much stronger than that on the smaller scales. And we could certainly have tornadoes, uh, significant tornadoes, even tomorrow, New Year's Eve uh, down in Louisiana. And as long as those ingredients come together uh, for tornadoes, it doesn't matter where you're located. It doesn't matter what time of year it is. Physics are, uh, is physics, uh, math is math, and you're gonna get uh, tornadoes if you have the ingredients together. One of the first ingredients that you really need for wintertime tornadoes is a very strong storm system. And that's that jet stream, those troughs that we've already talked about. That's in the upper layers of the atmosphere, 15,000 feet and up, up to 30,000 feet. And look at that bowling ball of a system that's going through Texas. Out ahead of that, you've got a lot of moisture surging north from the Gulf of Mexico. You get a strong surface low, almost like a Colorado low, but it's coming out of northern Mexico here. And really Louisiana to the east of that storm system where it's pumping up enough heat and moisture out of the Gulf of Mexico, you can generate enough instability uh, to get a tornado threat. And those ingredients, as I mentioned, wind shear and instability. And you may remember from the snow and the freezing rain plot that showed that little shallow layer of sub-freezing air at low levels, a little warm nose just above the ground, and then cold air aloft. Instability for tornadoes is totally different. You need warm, moist air all the way down to the ground level. We call that surface space instability. So as those temperatures of 70 degrees, big dew points are coming north from the Gulf of Mexico, that supplies the, the warmth and the moisture at the low levels of the atmosphere. But often during winter, high up in the atmosphere, you get very cold air. And those troughs that I showed you, those are just cold bowling balls of air that exist in the mid and high levels of the atmosphere. There it is over South Texas. Just to the east of that, uh, that cold air goes over top the warm and moist air that's surging north out of the Gulf of Mexico. And that's generating just enough instability uh, to get those tornadoes. Also, wind shear is key. You can't have a tornado without wind shear. And that's caused by changing wind speed and direction with height. I showed you that map there that shows weaker winds at the surface, stronger winds up aloft at the jet stream. That changing wind speed with height causes spin in the atmosphere. And then a thunderstorm comes along like a giant vacuum cleaner, stretches that spin into the vertical. And that's in general how you get tornadoes. But you can see that wind shear changing with height, winds increasing as you go up in the atmosphere, feeding off those temperature gradients with the cold air to the north and the warm air to the south. That's really the basics to get tornadoes and the wind shear in the lowest kilometer of the atmosphere is especially critical to get tornadoes. And now we're gonna start with another question. This is thinking more long-term. We've kind of looked at some smaller scale meteorology. We've looked all the way up to the, stor uh, the uh, storm system scale on the order of a thousand kilometers. But when you're talking about global warming, you're talking about much longer scales, even longer than the decades long scales as the earth is gradually warming overall. And so I'm gonna ask you a question related to that. If the earth is getting warmer, why are cold weather storms still getting more intense? It may seem like because the earth is warming up that you get more rain events, maybe less snow overall. 
but it's not necessarily the case. It's quite a bit more complicated than that. And it really comes down to also looking at anomalies versus averages. So when you see those maps of an entire globe that are above average based on a long-term average, sometimes those are a little bit above average, sometimes not. Uh, but usually most of those maps are showing steady warming across the globe. But those areas that are near polar locations, those positive anomalies are still below freezing. So those atmospheric profiles still support snowfall. And also in general, a warmer climate, a warmer planet can hold more moisture. A warmer, a warmer atmospheric profile is able to hold a lot more moisture inside it. Uh, so really the, uh, the oceans, oceans are getting warmer. The Gulf of Mexico is above, above average as well. You're able to supply these storm systems, energize them with big time moisture. That's uh, largely more available now than it ever has been uh, in our lifetime, definitely. And uh, anytime you're infusing that moisture with these systems and you still have the cold air available for snowfall, it causes big time impacts, very impactful winter storms, even though on an average, uh, the, the, the average is probably well above normal, depending on the base period that is selected. And also with lake effect snow, uh, the water temperatures of the Great Lakes are getting a bit warmer. Uh, they're staying ice free for a bit longer during the year. That leads to heavier lake effect snow emergency types of events until those lakes finally freeze over. This year, for example, the Great Lakes have hardly are not frozen over at all. So we've still got a lot more time of lake effect. A lot of times lake effect will continue into February uh, before those lakes will freeze over. But in general, a warming climate, a warmer atmospheric profile can hold more moisture. More moisture means heavier snow when the cold air is cold enough. And that's why overall uh, winter storms are not necessarily uh, going to be less severe in a warming climate. Hey, Reed, thank you. I, uh, I don't know. I, I mean, I learned a lot. I don't know if I should be thrilled or terrified of, uh, of all the different winter storms that, uh, that should be, you know, will be coming up across the country, though. I guess, like you said, it's, you know, it's an average. So, uh, so you know, some of us may be uh, warm and safe, but, uh, but it, at least everyone has, has learned a lot. And people have asked a ton of questions. So um, up for, for those veterans of these, uh, these varsity teachers classes, you guys know what's coming up next. For everyone else, one, keep your questions coming. We've got about 10 to 12 minutes to, uh, to hit uh, as many questions as we can for Reed to learn all about wild winter weather. I should also point out if, uh, if you're thinking, no, I want to learn more about tornadoes, Reed's going to be back closer to the spring when it's real tornado season to, uh, to help us uh, learn even a little bit more about those. So get those questions coming. Two, get your cameras ready. We're going to have uh, an opportunity to uh, to take uh, a selfie with Reed and with some, uh, some weather forecasting equipment so that you can post those to Instagram and win that prize. And then also, if you're sitting around thinking, hey, it's going to be a wild winter, I don't want to spend much time outside, but I want to keep learning, uh, make sure you check out varsitytutors.com. We have all kinds of exciting classes on weather, science, all kinds of other types of, uh, of activities and things. So check out varsitytutors.com. If you can't decide on one class, I recommend VT Plus, which is a subscription uh, service. You can take any class you want, uh, with uh, including some exciting weather-based classes. So with all that said, hopefully I've given everybody a chance to get your questions in and get those cameras ready. Um, Reed, you want to take that picture and then give everybody a chance to win? Let's do it. And I've got a, uh, some meteorological, meteorological equipment here too that uh, we can use in the photos. This is actually a microbarometer. So we talked about pressure uh, throughout this class. And this actually measures how low the pressure gets inside tornadoes or inside the outer bands of hurricanes. We call it the subsonic sensor. So basically tomorrow when I'm heading down to Louisiana, the goal is to place this in front of a tornado by about two kilometers and it'll measure all the different fine scale pressure oscillations inside. Basically, if you throw a rock inside a pond and waves emanate out from that, the same thing happens in the atmosphere as it behaves like a fluid and we're trying to measure those waves that get sent out from those tornadoes. I'm real excited for the selfie portion here. There you can see the subsonic. You could do a little point too if you want. I'll hold it on the other side so you can see the tornado. Never stop chasing. 
Awesome. Thanks, Reed. Hopefully everybody got a great picture. Uh, you also noticed that uh, that uh, Reed smiles a lot when he talks about weather because it is so exciting. So if you didn't get the perfect picture, uh, we'll have him on full screen during the Q&A. But I want to make sure we get a lot of questions came in. I want to make sure we get as, as many of them answered as possible. The number one theme you probably saw already coming through, Reed, was uh, about fear. Uh, people want to know. So let me give you a couple of them at once. Um, what type of storm are you most scared of? Um, what was the most scared you've ever been while chasing a storm? Let's maybe start with those two well the the good thing is is i i I very rarely am scared of thunderstorms and i used to be scared to death of thunder and lightning when i was really little uh, probably five or six years old Uh, and there's a fine line between fear and curiosity and i think that drove me to try to better understand these storms better understand how tornadoes happen what caused snowstorms and i've been obsessed with weather ever since so i think if you really understand how these storms work and how to forecast them and you watch them constantly, you always know what they're going to do next. And that, that way, it, you're, it's very easy to stay just outside of the path of them. With our armored vehicles, though, the Dominators, we're trying to intercept those tornadoes directly. And in that case, we outfitted our vehicle with armor on the outside, hydraulics, so we can drop it flush to the ground so no wind can get underneath. And that's a way that we just know how bad the conditions are inside those tornadoes. So we built a vehicle that can keep us safe uh, inside those storms or at least right next to those tornadoes. But I would say that I'm most afraid of hurricane storm surges. Uh, There's nothing more powerful than the force of water. Uh, It has a thousand times the density of uh, of air. And uh, when hurricanes come ashore, you get an eye that comes in, a big time eye wall. And right as that eye comes in, you get a tsunami-like surge of water called storm surge. Sometimes that storm surge can be greater than 20 feet high. It can have waves on top of that. And uh, that's just a, a, a weather event that is not survivable. And that's probably uh, what I'm most uh, afraid of, are hurricane storm surges. But tornadoes in general, they kind of give you clues on what they're going to do. So you can look at the storm structure. And we're going to cover this in our next class, of course. But you can really tell which way a tornado is going to move, especially if it's not moving side to side. That means it's likely coming right at you. I love that you know exactly when it's coming right at you. Sounds like you speak from experience. Uh, you mentioned the Dominator, which is fascinating. Had a, a, quite a few questions about that. Um, can you tell us kind of what was the inspiration for the Dominator? Kind of how did you decide to, uh, you know, to, to put it together? And then what was the inspiration for the name? People want to know a lot about the Dominator. Well, I, I used to storm chase. My first storm chasing vehicle was a 1985 Plymouth Reliant uh, growing up in Michigan there. And um, then for years, I would chase in vehicles that were basically held together with duct tape. Uh, But I'd always get so close to the tornado or the hail, my windows would blow out, you know, I would sustain a lot of vehicle damage. And uh, as I got a little older, I realized that we needed to put some armor on the outside of the vehicle so we can get close to the tornado, collect data that other people can't safely collect, and still stay stay safe around these big time uh, tornadoes. And so when we started Storm Chasers um, with Discovery, Uh, we built the Dominator uh, storm chasing vehicles. And initially I proposed the name Dominator as a joke uh, to our executive producer. Uh, I saw uh, this uh, image of something else that was called the Dominator, uh, some type of a drone. And I was like, hey, let's call it the Dominator so we can dominate the storm. And uh, next thing I know, the name stuck. And uh, this many years later, we built three of them. And the reason why we built three Dominators is that we can surround the tornado from three different sides and triangulate those wind speeds. And that way, then we can get a 3D profile of the winds inside of a tornado. But really, in general, I was intercepting tornadoes with a regular vehicle. So I figured I might as well add a little extra protection to to the vehicle. And it was actually built uh, by uh, an old boss of mine at the golf course that I worked at growing up. So I mowed grass on a golf course uh, when I was younger and the mechanic uh, there was the only person that I knew that was mechanically inclined enough to uh, build a vehicle like the Dominator. And we've been storm chasing in them ever since. That's amazing. I love that it got named, you know, kind of started as a joke. And then, you know, as, as nicknames tend to do, they start as jokes and then carry, you know, stay with you for life. Um, and I think that's uh, it's an important lesson too about networking, right? Staying in touch with people from your first job, all of a sudden it gives you a, a you know, a, a storm-proof, weather-proof vehicle that I mean, no one else has. So I think that's that's pretty amazing. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about your history in a second and, and how you got into, you know, you know, working with Discovery and all those kind of things. A couple of uh, specific weather things 
things first, and then we'll kind of end by talking about your experience. Um, can you tell us more about the polar vortex? I know a lot of people mention that as, as wild winter weather. I know the name sounds, uh, you know, almost similar to bomb cyclone in it's like, whoa, this is serious kind of a name like the dominator. What can you tell us about polar vortexes and, uh, and you know, what we should know about them? Well, we talked a lot about how those upper level storm systems and the troughs are associated with a bowling ball of cold air aloft. And usually those are pieces of cold air that come from higher latitudes as that trough will dig down into the lower latitudes. You get the cold air aloft that comes in. That's what creates those big hailstorms as well uh, in the spring when those troughs happen. But a polar vortex is one that has a massive area of really cold air aloft. And it still has that cyclonic spin because it's a trough of low pressure uh, coming, coming down from the poles. But it emanates from the polar front. Uh, as well, further north, up in the uh, up in the Arctic regions, uh, Antarctic regions down in the southern hemisphere, and uh, you can get just a massive cold blob that eventually will break down and surge down into the northern United States. Uh, they lead to lake effect events. Uh, the cyclonic curvature lobes of spin will spin around the polar vortex, enhance the lift and the moisture that we talked about as they go over the Great Lakes. And that's when you get the biggest lake effect snow emergencies as well. I covered some polar vortices there in Buffalo that dumped two to three feet of snow. Uh, temperatures, wind chills, minus 40, minus 50 uh, below. Uh, definitely uh, pol polar vortices are intense. And growing up in Michigan, I used to have to drive to school in my Plymouth Reliant with those wind chills at about 50 below it was definitely intense. I, we had that in common read. I grew up in Michigan. I, a few years ago, I was back home for the holidays and there was a polar vortex and I wanted to see you. I went, I went out running and I you know, had jacket and stuff on and, and it seemed fine. Negative 40, you know, my body heat's going. And then I turned a corner into the wind and it actually felt like someone was like slicing my skin with cold air. So uh, yeah, I, I, polar vortex is, uh, is nothing to mess around with. So um, thank you for that. Thanks for everybody for asking those. I'm, I'm a big fan of those. Uh, one more weather related question and then we'll get into kind of, you know, you, you know your history with with meteorology and kind of inspiration for everyone. What can you tell us about um, El Nino and La Nina? I know you, we've talked a little bit about how those may be contributing to, to some crazy circumstances now. What are they and, uh, and how do they impact the weather around us? So La Nina and El Nino are the two different phases of an oscillation uh, involving sea surface temperatures and also the overlying atmosphere in the tropical Pacific. And right now we have a La Nina, which is when there's cold water anomalously cold water that stretches along the equator all the way out to the dateline, a massive blob of cold water near the surface in the tropical and the extra tropical Pacific. The opposite of La Nina is El Nino when there's warm water in the tropical Pacific and the subtropics. And um, especially in winter, El Nino, we call it ENSO, El Nino Southern Oscillation. It's also associated with the pressure, pressure oscillation across the Pacific Basin. But those are big drivers of North American climate. Uh, the Pacific uh, Ocean is the largest uh, ocean basin on the entire planet, and it's located conveniently upstream relative to the jet stream to the west of us uh, of North America. And uh, so it's not surprising that the sea surface temperatures there in the Pacific will dictate uh, what happens climate-wise downstream or determine some of the weather or the average of that weather. But in general, with La Niñas, you usually get very active springs in terms of tornadoes. Uh, you'll often get a consolidated jet stream with open troughs, a train of troughs and ridges that just uh, surge across regularly across the United States. But with El Niños, with the warm water out there in the tropical Pacific, you get an energized subtropical jet. So there are two branches of the jet stream uh, in, in general, from the subtropics all the way up. There's a subtropical jet. And then there's the one to the north. That's the one we've been talking about mostly, the polar front jet stream up there. But the subtropical jet passes right over and, and really stems from that area in Hawaii. Atmospheric river events uh, definitely can be enhanced by El Ninos because of the warm temperatures out there, the more moisture as well, and kind of an energized southern branch of the jet. But El Nino and La Nina are definitely associated with different climate patterns downstream in North America, especially during winter. Thank you. That, that's a great explanation too. I know we, we all kind of, we, I think uh, us laymen uh, tend to, to think of them as, you know, similar because the names are similar, but that uh, makes sense that they're, you know, uh, you know, different enough, but related. So um, thank you. All right. The, the other huge question people had, so people want to know about your, your weather fears. Uh, we'll end on weather curiosity. Uh, a lot of people want to know, um, you know, one, how did you get in, into meteorology? 
Two, how did you decide to start chasing storms as the way that you experience meteorology? Uh, mm -hmm. And then three, what is your advice for? We've got you know hundreds, if not thousands, I think thousands, safe to say, of, of students out there right now um, who are interested in weather and, and may want to pursue a career like that. Um, so how did you get involved in meteorology? How, how did storm chasing become your thing? And uh, what's your advice for people who are, are curious about following a similar path? Similar path? Well, I've always been obsessed with the sciences uh, growing up, and I actually collected insects for about 10 years uh, when I was younger. I'd mount them in the boxes and specialized in on, uh, moths and scarab beetles, uh, but I was in Science Olympiad as well. Um, and uh, But weather was always my deep-rooted true passion from when I was very, very young. And so even though I got into insect collecting, I did the tree identification event in Science Olympiad in middle school and high school. Uh, weather was always my passion. And uh, whenever a severe thunderstorm warning would get issued at my house, I'd freak out, grab the family video camera, get pelted by hail outside. And uh, I realized that when you're staying in one location at your house, it's pretty rare to get hit by a big time storm. And I realized that if I could drive, I could see a lot more storms if I expanded my range beyond just a single point. And that's same goes for tornadoes, any individual point. It's very hard for that point to get hit by a tornado. But if you can drive, you're increasing your chances of seeing a tornado. And so I just started uh, storm chasing, driving into lake effect snow events. I would write uh, some prominent storm chasers at the time and professors, and they would point me in the right direction. And I realized that I had to follow my passion. Uh, I think that if you guys are uh, trying to find out what to do uh, for your, your career or for your, for your job, if you do what you love for a living, you're never going to work a day in your life. And it's going to be very easy to give it 120% passion. Every time I wake up in the morning, I'm fired up about weather. Am I going to build a dominator, a shoulder mounted uh, air cannon to shoot probes into tornadoes? And I'm just happy every day. And uh, I'm also thankful to have a science teacher for a mom that pointed me in the right direction and got me into the sciences and became a naturalist that way, collecting insects, reptiles, and amphibians. But really weather is my true passion. And I say never stop chasing a lot. And that doesn't only have to apply to storm chasing, but it applies to just never stop chasing your passions out there, whether it's in the sciences, whether it's in a field outside of the sciences, math, social studies, politics, it's all incredibly important. And as long as you're passionate about it, uh, then it's, it's very easy to give it 120% effort and enjoy every second. Man, that was, you can feel the passion and uh, unbelievable advice. So um, huge thanks. Hopefully everybody that's, uh, that's fascinated by weather was, uh, or fascinated by anything was, uh, was listening to that. I think that's uh, amazing advice. So um, Reed, huge thanks for, uh, for all of your insight and enthusiasm and, uh, and advice uh, for, for everyone out here. Um, I can tell you already, the, uh, the control booth has been letting me know that, uh, that we've got a, a blizzard happening on Instagram right now of everyone putting their pictures up there. So if you want to join that, We'll put up the instructions on the way out on a slide here. Remember, if you put that selfie up there, um, tag Reed Tim or tag Varsity Tutors, you'll be entered to win a, a wild, wacky weather kit that uh, can help fuel some of that passion for weather. So if you're uh, unable to chase storms, um, you know, this week, you'll be able to, to, to play with some in, uh, in the comfort of your own home. So um, a huge thanks to Reed. Let me put up those instructions here. Um, and uh, while we do that, thanks to Reed. Thanks to all of you for all of your, your, you know, your photos on Instagram, for all of your uh, questions and comments and everything throughout the class. Um, we wish everybody a really happy new year and uh, you know, an end to your winter break if, uh, if you're going back to school next week. Um, best of luck to those of you in Western Louisiana with the uh, uh, Dixie Alley storm coming through there. And uh, check us out at varsitytutors.com for even more exciting classes and, and opportunities to follow whatever your passion may be. So um, huge thanks, everyone.